Thanks very much, Dave, and thanks uh, to Alistair as well. I'm looking forward to talking to you later. Um, what I want to do in my talk today is start from um, a claim that Tony Chimiro makes. Let's see if I can get the clicker to work. Yeah, there we go. That's what's distinctive about radical embodied cognitive science is that it offers us a new ontology. And I'm going to take that to mean that it's offering an alternative to a physicalist ontology. So it's thinking that um, we can understand the being of mind uh, not as supervening on something physical, but uh, that we can make a distinction of some sort between the environment that we engage with in perception and action and physical reality. And it's that claim that I want to explore further with you today. And when I talk about radical embodied cognitive science, I'm talking about cognitive science that's non-representationalist. And so uh, that comes in many different flavors. There's inactivism, which I'll mention later on. Um, but the way that Tony's developed it and the work that we're doing in Amsterdam as well is combining an ecological psychology approach with dynamical systems theory. And where does that meet up with Gestalt psychology? Well, in many interesting ways, actually. Um, now, whether or not Gestalt psychology was non-representationalist, I think, is something we could discuss and debate. But certainly, there's a connection between Gestalt psychology and ecological psychology, and that's one of the connections that I'm going to be interested in today. And also between Gestalt psychology and dynamical systems theory. So that will be another uh, connection to follow up on. Both of those things are going to come back in the talk. But what I'm interested in initially is this distinction that we can make between the meaningful environment that we engage with in perception and action and physical reality. And I'm going to try to understand that distinction. That's going to be the main aim of my talk. So uh, here's Gibson in uh, his last book, The Ecological Approach. And he's making this distinction here. He says, the world of physical reality uh, does not consist of meaningful things, whereas the world of ecological reality does. So we have a distinction then between uh, a conception of uh, reality where it's hard to fit in uh, meaning and values and an ecological conception where uh, the difference between physical reality and ecological reality is that ecological reality is somehow meaningful. So it's this claim that I want to try to understand. What does it mean to say that the environment that we engage with in perception and action is meaningful, is value-laden? And how should we understand the resulting distinction then between physical reality, which is reality as described in mathematical mecha mechanistic terms, where we don't need to um, make mention of meaning or value, an ecological reality where, we, where that seems to be somehow value-laden. A starting point for thinking about how or what it means to say that reality is meaningful, that ecological reality is meaningful, is to start from the concept of valence. So in early work from Gibson, uh, he describes how... Uh, the path that a, a, a car travels along on a road can be thought of in terms of a, a line of forces. We can think of there being um, parts of the road that have negative valence that push us away from them and parts of the road that are safe to travel along, a field of safe travel. And this idea of valence as something that we experience, that uh, we experience uh, the emotional significance of reality is a central claim that I want to try to unpack and understand a bit more. Uh, because it's a claim that we find in ecological psychology, but also in Gestalt psychology. Gestalt psychologists talk about objects as having what they call a, a physiognomic character. And what they mean by that is that they wear their emotional value on their face in the same way as uh, somebody's facial expressions, you can read their emotions from their facial expressions. So similarly, 
the objects that we encounter in the environment, uh, we can read their emotional significance. And so you can see this here in, the, in this little diagram here from Gibson and Crooks. So there's an area here of the road which is safe for travel that has positive valence in that it draws us towards it when we're driving. And then there are other vehicles which are um, potentially dangerous to us and they are to be avoided. And so we can think of the road as a, a line of forces that's, that we move along, that we travel along. Um, so the idea that it's part of our experience of reality, it's part of the phenomenology of this experience that things have emotional significance is maybe part of the reason why we might think that reality as we experience it, the reality that we engage with in perception and action is meaningful and value-laden. It's meaningful and value-laden because the objects that we experience have this valence to them. So that might be one reason for thinking that we can make this distinction between uh, the reality we engage with in perception and action and physical reality because the reality that we experience has this physiognomic character, it has this valence to it. And this kind of distinction leads uh, Kofka in his 1935 Principles of Gestalt Psychology to draw a distinction between what he calls the geographical environment and the behavioral environment. We can think of this as a distinction between uh, the environment as its uh, experience from a point of view. So the geographical environment is the environment from a third person point of view. And his example that he gives is a little story of a, uh, a man who rides across a snowy plain and finds himself in an inn and meets the innkeeper and the innkeeper tells him that he's just ridden his horse over uh, a frozen lake constant. And uh, frozen lake constant can be understood as part of the geographical environment, a place in the geographical environment, or it can be understood as this snow-covered plain that supports locomotion. And so the behavioral environment then is the environment understood from the perspective of the agent, the environment that has these lines of forces that push us away or pull us towards them. Whereas the geographical environment is the physical environment, the frozen lake constant in this example. We find a similar distinction between uh, physical, physiochemical environment as it's described in, in activism and the uh, behavioral environment um, in that inactivists argue that our sense-making activities, our uh, bestowing meaning on things actually turns a physiochemical environment into uh, a sensory motor environment, a behavioral environment, an umwelt. So the classic example is the bacterium that is moving along uh, a sugar, a sucrose gradient that it's uh, sensed. As soon as it senses the sucrose gradient, it begins to tumble until it finds the right orientation and then it moves along the sucrose gradient, um, moves forward along the sucrose gradient. And uh, Evan Thompson says of this example that the sucrose only has meaning and value um, as the, uh, or in relation to the uh, bacteria's metabolism. So it's only through the sensory motor engagement of the bacteria with the sucrose that the sucrose takes on meaning and value of a nutrient. Um, so apart from the uh, bacterium's sensory motor engagement with the sucrose, it lacks this meaning. So there's a way in which the sensory motor engagement of the bacteria transforms the physiochemical environment into a meaningful environment, into an umwelt, into a behavioral environment, to use Kafka's expression. And this transformation happens um, in part based on the self-producing identity of the bacterium as a living system. So anyone that's not familiar with inactivism, the core claim of inactivism is that there's a continuity 
between living systems and cognitive systems. So we can understand the um, organizational properties of cognitive systems based on the kinds of organizational properties that living systems have. And living systems are operationally closed, so they're made up of processes that, um, that produce and maintain themselves over time in their interactions with the environment. So the idea is that we can use those very same organizational properties to understand what cognition is. And in this particular example, uh, we're seeing a, a basic kind of cognition in the bacterium's engagement with uh, the sucrose in that uh, based on its identity, based on its organizational properties which are produced and maintained over time, the bacterium gives meaning to the environment. It turns what would otherwise be a physiochemical environment where there's sucrose that's not yet a nutrient into something that has meaning and into something that has the meaning and value of a nutrient. Okay, so what I've done so far is show you that there's a distinction between the behavioral environment and the geographical, physical environment that um, was originally to be found in the writings of the Gestalt psychologists, but it's also there in ecological psychology, and it's also there, I'm not going to fall over it, in, um, in the inactivist writings. So we have a common claim to at least uh, two branches of radical embodied cognitive science. There's this distinction to be made between uh, the physical environment, the geographical environment, physical reality, reality as described from a third person point of view, and the behavioral environment, which is the environment that's given meaning from the perspective of a living system in the case of inactivism. Um, we'll see that ecological psychology has slightly different ways of making this distinction. So the question I want to take up now is what's the relation then between uh, this behavioral environment, the environment that has meaning and value for living systems according to inactivists, um, the environment that is um, perceived in terms of uh, valences and our geographical and physical environment. How should we think about the relation between these two conceptions of the environment? In Gestalt psychology, I think you find the claim that the behavioral environment somehow mediates between the uh, agent and its behavior and the physical environment. So the behavioral environment is, in some sense, and I'm going to try to unpack, mediating between the physical environment and the behavior of uh, a person or an animal. And I think that claim gets them into all kinds of trouble that ecological psychology avoids. Um, so I want to suggest that uh, this idea of the behavioral environment as mediating is not something that non-representationalist cognitive science should embrace. Uh, they should rather embrace a view of the behavioral environment and the physical environment as uh, being more entangled in a way that I'm going to try to explain as my talk goes on. So why did... Um, what, what exactly, sorry, before we go on to the five phenomena, what exactly led the Gestalt psychologists to understand the relation in, the, in these mediation, uh, medi, medi, uh, mediating terms? Well, uh, I'm going to suggest that what's behind it is the principle of psychophysical isomorphism, which is um, the way that Gestalt psychologists understand the relationship between uh, the dynamical self-organizing processes in the brain and consciousness. They take there to be a relationship between uh, what we would now describe in terms of self-organizing processes and uh, the contents of consciousness which are uh, organized and have this gestalt quality to them, have this physiognomic character that I described. The relation between them is one of uh, isomorphism or correspondence. And one claim that everyone knows Gestalt psychologists want to make is that we can't understand uh, the organization of experience 
in terms of sensations. And so they reject what's called the constancy hypothesis, the idea that somehow our experiences are built up from sensations as building blocks. So that, they're, so that the sensations map onto stimulation, and then we can build up conscious experience from those sensations. They argue rather that there has to be some kind of organizing principles at work. And those organizing principles are what uh, we're already seeing described in Evo Kola, also in Kafka, in terms of self-organizing processes, or what we would now think of as self-organizing processes. So this is the classic example from Wertheimer of the uh, phi phenomena. You see uh, these dots flashed up with a certain interval between them. And when the interval is, I think, around 200 milliseconds, then you see a single dot moving around the display. And the single dot is not something that you're presented with. So what you're experiencing there, the single dot moving, is somehow the result of organizing processes. And these organizing processes were understood by the Gestalt psychologists in terms that we would now, well, in terms of physics, um, in terms that were anticipating ideas from dynamical systems theory. So visual experience, the, the way that things look, which is what Kafka was interested in, why do things look the way they do? He was interested in understanding the phenomenology of our experiences. And he argued we couldn't understand that in terms of building up experience based on sensations. Rather, there has to be some kind of organizational processes at work. And those organizing processes are not going to be explained by sensory stimulation, which uh, stands in some kind of one-to-one -one relationship with sensations. They're going to have to be explained instead in terms of some kind of constructive process, whereby, based on self-organizing physical processes, you get a physiological field, and that physiological field can then be mapped onto, uh, corresponds with our organized experience. Now, if we say then that the meaning and value that's there in the behavior and environment has to be reconstructed in this way based on some kind of dynamical gestalt laws, um, then I think we're going to run into some problems. If we combine the following two claims, that meaning and value is somehow reconstructed based on these self-organizing physiological processes, that's what I just described, and we combine that with the claim that the behavior and environment is distinct from the geographical environment in the way that we have just been explaining with the late constant, uh, frozen late constant example, valence. If we combine these two claims, it seems that we then have to say that the behavioral environment is some kind of private phenomenal reality that has an existence only in relation to uh, individual. And I think that there are ways out of this for representationalists. So if we think that the organizing uh, principles are cognitive in some sense, um, then, and they work maybe along computational lines so that um, perceptual processing can be understood as the process of building up a representation, then uh, we can say, well, maybe there's a representation that connects us, um, that helps us to, to get connected to a geographical environment, a physical environment. Uh, so the behavioral environment would have its basis in some kind of representational processes, and those would then help us to connect to a shared public world. But that kind of response is not going to be very helpful for a non-representationalist cognitive science. So if an activist were to embrace the uh, dynamical internalism, as I've called it, of Gestalt psychology, that would lead them into, into problems. It would lead them into having to make this, well, it would lead them into a conception of the behavioral environment that was rather solipsistic looking. Gibson already criticized Kafka on these grounds. He said, to say that behavior occurs in a phenomenal world leads to difficulties. If this means that each and every animal, man, behaves in his own private world, then it's uh, surely a mischievous idea.
um, and uh, Barry Smith, the Gestalt philosopher, picking up on this, points out, well, if we did think of the behavior and environment as this private phenomenal reality, how would we then account for the common environment that different animals inhabit? How would we account for the way in which the frog is able to catch the fly or the fly is able to escape from the frog? And so uh, we don't want the idea of the behavioral environment as some kind of private phenomenal reality. So I want to suggest that what's doing the mischief here is actually an idea of uh, stimulation uh, that Thomas Lombardo has called optical pointillism and that the Gestalt psychologists seem to have subscribed to. So at the same time as they were denying that experience is built up from uh, elementary sensations, they were still accepting a view of um, stimulation as kind of atomistic and point-like. And so what arrives at the retina are lots of isolated uh, um, sensory stimuli in the form of light. And I think that if we, if we reject optical pointillism, which is what ecological psychologists do, then uh, we have a different way of thinking about the relation between the behavioral and the physical environment. And that's what I want to finish up explaining. I'm going to have to go quite quickly because Dave's already showed me I've only got 10 minutes left. Um, so instead of thinking that uh, the structure has to be built up from organizational um, dynamical processes in the brain, let's say, we can instead think that there's structure that's located distally and that's preserved in what Gibson called the medium of reflected light. I want to think a little bit about this notion of the medium, raise some critical questions about it, uh, and that will lead me to, I think, an alternative view of how these two notions of the environment are related. So the medium, as Gibson understands it, is a set of points of observation that can be occupied by a moving animal and that um, light, that light and the medium carries uh, energetic forms of stimulation such as light, sound vibrations, mechanical vibrations, and so on. So the perceiver is surrounded by this medium moving through it, and the medium is both what we move through and also what provides us with our sensory information. And Gibson argues that, that's, that the medium is structured in such a way as to allow us to directly perceive the layout of the environment. This should all be familiar to anyone that knows anything about um, ecological psychology. The surfaces of things act as an interface between the substances that are the layout of the environment and um, the medium, which is carrying information about those substances. And so at each observation that the um, that the animal can occupy, there's information that converges to that point of observation that specifies the layout of the substances in the environment. So we can make a, to make this a bit more clear, we can make a contrast between an environment where light is distributed in such a way that it doesn't really contain any useful information about how the substances are laid out and an environment in which that's not the case. So the fog-filled medium here, light converges on a point of observation, but it's scattered by the fog, so you can't learn anything about the way that the surfaces in that environment are laid out. Um, and therefore, you can't learn anything about the substances because the surfaces are the interface between the medium and those substances. Whereas in a non-fog-filled medium, you have a perceiver that's moving around, and the medium is being transformed in such a way as to carry information about the substances. And so you can see here what Gibson called the ambient optic array in his picture of this from uh, the 1979 book. And um, there are 
there's light bouncing off the surfaces uh, in that environment, and, though, and that light is then converging to a point of observation in such a way that the perceiver is able to pick up information about those substances and where they are. And ultimately, what uh, Gibson wants to argue, what you can do with those sub uh, substances. You can pick up information about the affordances of those substances. So what I want to do in the last part of my talk is to raise some questions about the information about idea and then go back to the um, behavioral and geographical environment distinction and say a little bit about how to think about that from an a ecological perspective. Well, we ought to already be able to see that there's not going to be a hard distinction to be drawn anymore because the medium that's providing you with information about affordances is, um, is not distinct from the, the layout of the substances and surfaces in, in the environment. So there's not a mediation anymore. The behavior and environment is not mediating between the agent and the physical environment. Or if it is, then it's not doing that in a mischievous way. It's not doing that in such a way as to uh, create a solipsistic reality around the perceiver. <clears throat> but to finish up, I want to uh, ask some questions about the medium. And this is based on work that I'm doing with Ludger van Dijk in Amsterdam. And so water, is it a substance or a medium? Well, uh, Gibson says it's a medium for fish, but it's a substance for terrestrial animals. But what happens when we start using diving equipment? Well, what happens for children uh, that live in uh, Thailand who are able to, um, to see underwater because they've acquired skills of diving at a very young age that give them a visual acuity that's much more precise than you find in normal children or in other children. Um, well, what, what seems to be happening here is that what would count as a substance for a terrestrial animal now based on our skills, now based on our equipment, becomes a medium through which we can see uh, the surfaces, the substances of this underwater environment. So instead of thinking of the distinction between medium and substances as a, a hard and fast distinction, I want to suggest a different inactive take on this, that we think of uh, this distinction as one that's dependent on the skills of the animal, dependent on the actions, the skills, the skilled engagement of the animal. So when you're wearing diving equipment, then the underwater environment uh, is uh, a medium. But if the diving equipment stops working, let's say, then the underwater environment suddenly becomes a substance for you, one that is potentially life-threatening. So the status of the environment as either a medium or a substance is dependent on our skills, is dependent on our skilled engagement with it. And Ludger, in his work on information, has argued that the kinds of correspondence between the ambient array and the structure in the environment we should think of as dependent on its use for its counting as information. So that correspondence relation between the array and the physical environment only gets to be information, um, be, only gets to be information in its use, in its skilled engagement with it by the agent. So you might have thought, well, has Gibson really escaped the um, idea of the behavior and environment as some kind of mediating link between the agent and the physical world. Well, we want to argue that he has escaped that uh, mediate, mediating view of the behavior and environment because the medium which connects us to affordances uh, only, has, only does that work for us, only counts as information through its use, through its actual being made use of in uh, the animal's engagement, in the animal's coordination with affordances. So, uh, to wrap up, Gibson seems to be able to escape the uh, duality 
of the behavioral environment, the geographical environment that I think uh, you find in Gestalt psychology and that ultimately leads them to a kind of phenomenalist view of the behavioral environment um, because he thinks that uh, all animals are surrounded by a medium uh, that they both move through and that gives them information about affordances. And then picking up on this notion of information about affordances, I finished up by arguing that uh, that information only gets to be about affordances through its actually being used, through its being taken up in skillful action by an animal. And so we shouldn't think of information now in the ambient array as some kind of mediating link between the agent and the environment because there literally is no information there until the agent begins to skillfully engage with affordances. Um, I'm not going to talk more about affordances but we think a similar kind of claim is going to apply to affordances. So affordances literally um, get their form, get their determinacy through the actions of individuals, through the individual's engagement with those affordances. And we have a story about how that engagement has to be understood in terms of social practices in the case of humans. And so it turns out that affordances uh, depend for their existence on social practices. But that's a topic for another paper. Thanks very much.